three, and. Thank you, Chosen, for leading us in worship. We're so grateful for your participation in chapel here at Christian Heritage. Let's pause and pray together, shall we? Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to come together regularly and worship you. We're thankful for this place that is seeking day by day to glorify you. Thank you that we've had the opportunity to be in class uh, so consistently this year. We're grateful for that. And we ask now that you will calm our hearts, that you will help us to focus our minds 
and reflect upon the words that we are about to hear from our speaker. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, my name is Rob Hansen, and I serve here at Christian Heritage in the area of Advancement Advisor, which means that I help Dr. Hertzberg with regard to fundraising and alumni relations. And it's my privilege to be with you today and to introduce our speaker. Way back in the 1980s, I worked with middle school, middle school students just like you. I loved the energy and enthusiasm that students your age had for life. One day, I met an especially friendly kid with a huge grin who had tons of energy about our program. He was 12 years old at the time and came as a guest of one of our regular students. I remember so clearly that he was friendly and he was outgoing. He was excited to get totally involved with everything we did. For a couple of years, he was involved with our youth group, but after he graduated from junior high, I lost track of him. That is until I started working here at Christian Heritage Academy. One day we reconnected and suddenly realized that we had known each other so many years ago. I was so encouraged to hear how the Lord had worked in his life. Now, that young man who I knew as a fun-loving, energetic middle schooler is a pastor. And his name is Anthony Lacasio, and he is our speaker here for chapel today. Pastor Lacasio serves the Life Church in Glenview, and he and Mrs. Lacasio have three children who attend CHA, one in the lower school, one in the middle school, and one in upper school. Pastor Anthony became a Christian in his college years, and he was dramatically and completely converted, and he became a dedicated follower of Jesus Christ, and then eventually a pastor. I know you will appreciate his message for you today, so I would encourage you to listen closely and to think about how God may be working in your life to move you towards service for him in your life in the future. Hey, it is so wonderful to be here together on a Friday morning chapel with you. I was so honored and so thrilled when I was asked to speak to you today because I love speaking to young people. I love being with young people. Um, and I realized we're not really together. I had to speak to a camera, but I still am very honored and thrilled to be a part of your morning chapel. Also want to um, give honor to Rob Hansen. Mr. Hansen knew me 30 plus years ago um, when I was a depressed uh, and discouraged and ungodly 12 year old boy. Um, who a couple of guys uh, invited me to church one day and I felt the presence of God so strong in my life and um, really never escaped that. I lived the next eight years of my life um, the wrong direction. I uh, ended up getting into a life of drugs and alcohol and I ended up in jail and I made a lot of mistakes in life and then God found me and his infinite mercy decided to pick me up out of the dirt and um, bring me into the life that I live now. 30 plus years later, uh, I meet a man and he says, do you know Dan Swanson and Mike Swanson? I said, yeah, I grew up with those guys. And uh, he said, uh, I, I know, do you remember me? My name's Rob Hansen. I said, um, I kind of remember, I'm not, have we met before? You know, I wasn't sure and he said, you went to the youth group that I was the youth pastor of 30 years ago and I remember you, I remember your name. We prayed for you and that stuck with me, Mr. Hansen. You prayed for me. I went home that night and I thanked the Lord for those prayers. It took me about eight years, but those prayers caught up to me um, and I'm very grateful for that. And it was, a, it was just an honor and a joy to get reconnected. Um, so your prayers matter and you're bringing hope to a broken world. And I was uh, given the scripture um, about hope. It's Psalms 37 and three says, trusting in the Lord, bringing hope to the world. And uh, we're gonna talk about bringing hope to the world. This world needs hope. If there ever was a time the world needs hope, it's now. And um, so there's a way that we can bring hope. There's a climate that our country needs 
uh, to change. It needs hope injected into it. The, the environment all around us just desperately needs longing for some hope. And we can bring that hope to this world. But before we do, I want to um, read a few verses. And um, I'm going to ask you three questions today. And uh, before you go back to class, you need to answer those three questions and uh, on how to bring hope to this world. Right now, my daughter's going to read our first verse. Fia, would you take that one, um, the one verse in 2 Corinthians, please? 2 Corinthians 4, 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Thank you, Fia. The treasure is in the jars of clay. The treasure is in the container. You are a treasure chest. You are a container of something very valuable, something very wonderful. You are the container of hope. You, the previous verse talks about light shining through us, um, shining in us, the knowledge of God, the glory of God shining through us, but we're just the jars of clay. We're just containers. We are carriers of the glory of God. We bring the treasure with us um, and we bring the light. We bring hope. We bring it with us everywhere we go. You remember the story of Gideon? Gideon was a man and his army was, he led an army of 300 people and all they had were pots of clay and inside the pot of clay was a torch. It was a light, it was a lantern. And they broke the pots, they broke their jars and let that light shine and it scared the enemy witless. It confounded them. There's a power in the light that's inside of you. That is the hope that this world needs. You may think, you know, I'm, I'm nobody special. I, I can't really be a, a big bright light in this world. You know, and I would say to you that you don't, you don't really know the power of that light that's inside of you, if that's how you think. In fact, the value comes from what is inside. We are earthen treasures. We are, we are uh, earthen vessels. The treasure is in the container. So what value does the container have? Oh, it has a tremendous amount of value. It's the thing that's bringing this treasure, bringing this hope to the world. We're in the middle of a pandemic. Lots of restaurants were closed for a while. Many people ordered out when the restaurants um, were there for takeout and they the, the DoorDash or Uber or whatever would bring some food. I remember the pizza man came and it brought such a wonderful smell and, and the environment totally changed. And we brought the pizza to the table, opened up the box and enjoyed. Um, one of my favorite things to do is eat pizza. And we enjoyed that pizza together. Maybe you've had an experience of ordering food and, um, and, that, pe and that food comes to you. Um, and one thing that you really don't, think about is how important that box is how valuable now it's not much money it's probably a 50 cent box cardboard very little ink on it i mean it's just just garbage really but not so much garbage because it is bringing to you a very valuable wonderful treasure inside the pizza comes in the box it's not that the box gives value to the pizza it's the pizza that gives value to the box. It's an important thing. Otherwise you'd be delivering this greasy, dripping hot thing. And it's like, what are you doing? The pizza man wouldn't get a tip because he's got this cheesy, greasy mess. I, I, I can't take it. I can't handle it. I need a container to bring it to me. I need to relate to it. You are the container of the glory of God. There's value in that. And so I got three questions for you. Um, today, I would like for you to answer the first one. I want before I ask the question, I want to introduce you to somebody. Um, this is a, a, a man whose name is uh, Daniel Gabriel Fahrenheit. Daniel Gabriel Fahrenheit. Maybe you recognize the last name Fahrenheit. It has something to do with temperature. Has something to do with degrees or something. 
Um, do you recognize this um, device here? It's not a pen. Um, maybe you've never seen one of those. Um, have you seen one of these? Maybe on the wall somewhere? You probably have seen one of these. This is an older version of uh, of that and uh, of what uh, of what this uh, man invented. Um, it's a thermometer, isn't it? Now, I know you've seen one of these. That's a thermometer. You used it this morning. Daniel Gabriel Fahrenheit is credited with the invention of the thermometer. Now, in back in um, his day, there was mercury that was used, and the mercury would rise to the level of whatever the environment it was in, and it would it would read out what temperature it is in the room. A, a thermometer measures the environment that it is thrust into and reflects that environment. It doesn't change anything except it changes itself to match the environment that it's in. And so that's what a thermometer is. I want you to keep that in mind. A thermometer will measure the environment and just match that environment and, and become whatever that environment is. If your forehead is 98.6, the thermometer is going to tell you, yes, 98.6, I have matched this level right here. And that's what a thermometer does. It tells you what the environment is. Now I want to introduce you to another person. His name is Cornelius Dribble. There he is. Cornelius Dribble sounds like a college basketball coach's name, but in the early 1600s, Cornelius Dribble invented this thing. Eventually, it became this thing. Um, this you may not recognize. Maybe you've seen it on the wall. Anybody know what that is? Maybe this one. You've seen this one perhaps in your in your homes. Um, again, it's on the wall. That's a thermostat. Okay, there's some buttons on there, and it'll... Um, turn the air conditioning on or the heater on with, with just the push of a button. Maybe these are, look more familiar to you in your homes, the more modern looking ones. But Dremel uh, uh, invented the thermostat. Now, let me tell you the difference between a thermometer and a thermostat. A thermometer just tells you what the environment is and it matches it. It just kind of becomes whatever its environment is. But a thermostat says, no, I'm going to change my environment. I'm going to bring something that I have to the room. I'm going to bring some cold air to the room because it's getting too hot in here. I'm going to bring some heat to the room because it's just getting too cold. I'm going to change the environment. I'm not just going to reflect what, what's in it. I'm going to change the environment. And so my question, my first question to you today is, are you a thermostat or are you a thermometer? Do you just go with the flow of whatever the environment is and you just kind of, you know, if whatever's happening, whatever gossip is being spoken or whatever rude thing, whatever jokes are being told, whoever's laughing at this person or whatever, you just kind of join the crowd, you do that. Or are you a thermostat that says, you know, I don't like this environment. I think it's too hot. I'm going to actually chill it out a little bit. It's getting a little heated in here or, or, or it's a little you know, it's a little cold and not very warm in here. And I'm, I'm going to bring some warmth. I'm a thermostat, not a thermometer. I'm not just going to go with the flow. I'm going to create the flow. Um, so I have to ask that question. Are you a thermostat or are you a thermometer? I know some people, and you're going to think of some people as well that you know, that just brighten the room up whenever they show up. Whenever they come to the room, they just change the environment just by their smile or by their infectious laugh. Somebody I'm thinking of right now has got a giggle that just when they giggle, it's like everybody wants to giggle right along. There's people like that. There's kind people that are just so gentle and kind when they talk to you. You trust them and you just feel warm. You feel safer. Um, and there's just different kinds of people that will change the environment that they are in. If you're going to bring hope to this world, you're, you're going to need to show up with an intention to be a thermostat. This world needs to change its environment. The climate of this world, our country, the climate perhaps that you're being impacted by needs to be changed by little jars of clay that have a thermostat mentality that says, I'm going to change the environment I'm in um, and I'm going to bring hope to a broken world. The second question I have for you, so question one again, are you a thermostat or are you a thermometer? The second question I have 
um, is going to come from another portion of scripture that we'll read. And that is found in Corinthians chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, which we'll read. We'll have Fia read uh, for us again here in a second. Um, but the question is this. What do you smell like? I want you to ask the person sitting next to you, how do I smell? And no, don't do that. Don't answer it. But just think about it. What is your fragrance? What is your smell like? Theo, will you read that verse for us? But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one a fragrance from death to death, to the other a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? All right, thank you, Fia. So we have an aroma, don't we? We have a fragrance, the Bible says. I like this other translation of the same scripture that says this. I am grateful that God always makes it possible for Christ to lead us to victory. God helps us spread the knowledge about Christ everywhere. And this knowledge is like the smell of perfume. In fact, God thinks of us as a perfume, a perfume that brings Christ to everyone. For people who are being saved, this perfume has a sweet smell and leads them to a better life. We have an aroma, uh, uh, either a smell of victory and life to some or the smell of death. I, I, I like uh, um, to think that we have a, a certain smell unto God. Just like your physical body has some senses, taste, uh, hearing, smell, sight, touch, uh, your spiritual body also operates in the same way. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. It's a spiritual taste. And we uh, are a sweet smell in the nostrils of God. It's a, smir a spiritual smell. I don't mean the smell under your arms. I mean the smell that God smells when book the book of Revelation says that the prayers of the saints was the incense that burned up into the nostrils of God. God told Moses in the Old Testament to take sweet spices, to mix them together in a bowl, to crush them up, and to burn them as incense unto, unto God in the temple, in the uh, tabernacle, in the place of worship. And then he said, make some ointment, make some oil, crush these spices and make it smell good and sprinkle the oil everywhere in the place of worship. For my place of worship should have a sweet smell about it. And so uh, this ointment was used in worship time. And uh, so we today are supposed to have a spiritual scent of worship and praise unto God that is pleasing to God. How do we have that scent everywhere we go? How do we leave a fragrance of the hope of Christ? How do we leave that smell everywhere we go? Um, well, we can do it by knowing God, by being obedient to his word and answering the call to bring hope to others. How do you smell today? How is um, your ointment and your obedience and your praise unto God? Solomon, the guy that wrote uh, the book of Ecclesiastes in, um, in chapter nine, I believe it is, he said, as dead flies are a stench in the ointment, so it is a little folly to a man's life. Just a couple of mistakes can overwhelm the wisdom and the uh, and the good choices that you've made. Isn't it something that negativity is so much easier to spread than positivity? It's like lies and rumors will spread so much faster than the truth. Uh, somebody said that a lie can go around the world, all the way around the world, or halfway around the world before truth just laced up his shoes for the day. You know, I mean, there's just so much, it's so much easier to be negative than it is to be positive. That's why it's so rare and so wonderful when people are in a positive mood and they're spreading the joy of the Lord and they have this heart that's right with God and obedient with God and uh, and they're spreading that. That's the fragrance that um, that God is looking for. That is how you bring hope to a broken world. But maybe you have flies in your ointment. Maybe. Maybe then you need something in your heart that needs to be made right with God before 
um, you can leave that aroma that God is looking for to those around you. David said, the lifting of my hands is like the evening sacrifice. The sweet smell in the nostrils of God is like the lifting of my hands in praise to you. Um, the sacrifice of praise. There's a scripture that changed my life when I was younger. Um, it's found in Isaiah. It's the scripture that Jesus read in the temple, Isaiah 61. He writes that the Messiah was to come to bring beauty for the ashes and for mourning or for sadness, he was going to give us the oil of joy, the oil of gladness. What a beautiful thing that is. It's a scented oil that just is, that makes you joyful, makes you happy. And there's a garment of praise that he gives us for the spirit of heaviness or the faint spirit. In the original text, that word actually means depressed. He gives us a garment of praise for when we're depressed. And that's a beautiful thing. Sometimes we just need to praise the Lord. You know, sometimes we just need to find some things that we're grateful for and have an attitude of gratitude to bring to this world. And there's nothing like the oil of joy, that scented oil that some people have. You know, those people that are just always joyful. They're just pleasant to be around. That's bringing hope to a broken world. Praising God and uh, making the room smell right again. Uh, it's a cure for depression. I learned that a long time ago. And I'm very thankful for that lesson because I've used it many times. Sometimes I get discouraged, but I'll just start praising the Lord and it will lift my discouragement off and I'll start smelling good again. All right. So how do you smell today? Are you a thermostat or a thermometer? And how do you smell today? Third question I want you to answer before we go back to our class, finish the rest of this chapel is, uh, is this. How do you show up? I know that you show up. I know that you've come to school today. I know that you go home and you show up to your family. You show up to your friends. You're, you, you appear before people everywhere. But how do you show up? Um, God is looking for people who will show up in a certain way that will bring hope to this world. Always matter. Uh, always remember, rather, that it matters how you show up, not just if you show up. It does also matter how you show up. I always tell people at church that they should leave a room cleaner than they found it, okay? If you're gonna go to the bathroom, if you're gonna go in the kitchen and you're gonna use the facilities, leave it cleaner than you found it. That's the rule. You don't have to clean up after somebody else, but just clean up after yourself in such a way that it's cleaner than when you found it. Leave a room happier than the way you found it. Bring something to, uh, to the place you show up to that's gonna make it a better place when you're done. That's how you need to show up. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Solomon, the, the guy who wrote uh, Ecclesiastes again, he also said in chapter nine, he said, um, it's the YOLO verse. I call it the you only live once verse, the YOLO verse. He, he said, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might because you can't do it when you go to the grave. And um, uh, my dad used to say, uh, he always used to say, look, Anthony, if you're gonna do anything, uh, and it's worth doing, you might as well do it right. Anything worth doing is worth doing right, he would say. And he drilled that in, into me, a, a, a desire for excellence. You're 12, 13 young people. It brings me, an old man, such great joy and a lot of hope in this world to see you serving your community. Maybe there's somebody that's down and discouraged and they need some joy. You bring them that joy. That brings a lot of hope to the world. I see you doing that. I see you serving God. I see you having joy. I see that you're a thermostat and not a thermometer. You, you're, you're not discouraged and depressed. Listen, depression is just a faulty thinking of, of yourself or of the situation around you. You're not what you think you are. You're not what the world says you are. You're not even what, uh, what the, you know, what the devil says you are. That's for sure. You are what God says you are. And that's all you are. You are exactly what the Lord says you are. And he says you are a container for the joy and the hope that he has given you to bring it to this world. I hope that I've helped you 
today. I bless you in Jesus' name. So honored to be able to speak to you, to, to speak to you. Uh, really an honor. I really appreciate it. And I challenge you to go and bring hope to your world today. God bless you.